So about four months ago, I was in the market for a new laptop. Um, I don't use laptops that often. Usually I'm at home on my desktop computer, but I've been doing more traveling and uh, working well traveling. So um, I've kind of needed a better uh, laptop. I've been using a 2011 MacBook Pro up until now. And that thing is still surprisingly usable, but it's starting to get at the end of its lifespan. Uh, the video footage that I'm using is just getting to be a little bit too high quality for that thing. So I was looking at new MacBooks, and I was assuming that I'd have to get a MacBook Pro because I do a lot of video editing and a lot of picture editing, and that's pretty heavy on computers. I was starting to hear some rumors about the new processors that Apple was going to make for their own computers, um, because up until now they've been using Intel chips, and I won't, I won't get too into the details of how that's been working out, but basically for the past few years, uh, Intel hasn't been delivering on a lot of the promises that they've been making for their processors, and it's kind of been holding the MacBook line back. But when I was looking for this new MacBook, nobody really knew when those were coming out, so I just pulled the trigger and bought an Intel-based MacBook Pro. So what I ended up getting was this 2020 MacBook Pro. This is a 13-inch version. It is a 10th generation Intel processor, uh, quad core, and 2 gigahertz. This one came with 16 gigabytes of RAM and it has the built-in Intel Iris graphics chip. When I got this MacBook Pro, I was pretty impressed with it. Um, it's just as fast as my desktop computer in a lot of ways. But then a couple months after I got this MacBook Pro, that's when Apple released their M1 chip and now all of their MacBooks have their own processor in it. I started seeing a lot of reviews on these new M1 MacBooks and what they're capable of is just unbelievable. And I realized that the new MacBook Air might be as good, if not better, than the older MacBook Pro. Um, I never even considered getting a MacBook Air because those are kind of consumer level computers and they're not really powerful enough for professional use. But after watching some of these reviews on the new MacBook Air, um, it was looking like the new M1 MacBook Air could hold up to the older Intel-based MacBook Pro. Even though both these computers are re released in 2020, um, there's a big difference between what's actually inside them. I have a feeling that the value of this Intel-based MacBook Pro is going to go down really fast once the word gets out about how good these new M1 Macs are. So uh, I wanted to get the new M1 Mac and sell my old MacBook Pro pretty quickly before the value of the of the Intel based Pro went down. So since I have the new M1 based MacBook Air here and the older Intel based MacBook Pro at the same time, I thought I'd do some comparison tests before I put this one up on eBay. Wanted to make sure that this one is actually as good as everyone is saying it is. And for the most part it seems to be better than the Intel based MacBook Pro. So this video is mostly for people who already have some Intel-based um, MacBook and they're wondering if it's worth upgrading or not. And just for fun, I'm going to compare some of the results of these two computers compared to my older 2014 iMac. That thing is still holding up just fine and it's still my main computer. It's what I edit everything on. It has a 3.5 gigahertz quad-core processor, 32 gigabytes of RAM, and a decent graphics card in there. Uh, so just for fun, I'm going to compare some of the results that I get on these two laptops compared to my older iMac. I do outdoor videography and photography for a living, so that's basically all I'm going to be testing on these computers. The two programs that I use the most by far are Adobe Lightroom and Final Cut. Those are the only two things that I'm going to be testing for this video. One thing to keep in mind is that since the new M1 Macs have a completely different processor and language that they're using, all the applications are going to have to update and optimize their programs to run on the M1 Max. Um, all of the Apple programs like Final Cut have been optimized, but Adobe programs haven't been optimized yet, so they have to run through a translator called Rosetta. So you would think that that would slow things down, but even though Lightroom is running through a translator, it still ends up beating the Intel-based Mac on some of these tests. Some other things that are definitely worth taking into account, regardless of their actual performance, uh, one thing is that the MacBook Pro has a fan built into it, and the MacBook Air doesn't even have a fan. One major problem with the Intel chips is that they tend to overheat. It's really a testament to the M1 chip that they don't even need to build a fan into the MacBook Air. 
Uh, it still does get hot and it does throttle down just a little bit over heavy workloads, but the chip is so efficient that they don't even need to use a fan to cool the computer down. Another thing to take into account is that this MacBook Pro has four Thunderbolt ports and the MacBook Air only has two Thunderbolt ports and those are all Thunderbolt 3. That is something that I did like about this Pro is that it had four ports. Oftentimes I'm using three or more so it will be kind of a hassle to only have two ports on this uh, MacBook Air. And another thing is the touch bar. Everybody has their own opinion on that with the MacBook Pros. Um, I found it kind of handy but it's not something that I used a whole lot so it doesn't really matter to me having the touch bar or not but the MacBook Air does not have the touch bar so it's not something that I'll miss very much but it is kind of a nifty thing to have when you do have it and other than that the only thing that I'm really interested in with these computers is their performance I'll just say right now that both of these laptops are actually pretty impressive with the amount of um, high quality pictures or video that they can process starting off I'm gonna be doing some tests in Lightroom and I think a good way to test out the performance of each computer is to edit a time lapse and then export it. An average time lapse for me is 300 pictures, and these are 300 raw pictures coming out of my Sony A7 III. Um, so they're decently high quality files. And to make that time lapse, I simply edit one picture and then paste the settings to the entire 300 picture sequence, and then I export 300 pictures turning those raw files into JPEGs, and then I bring those JPEGs into Final Cut to compile it all into one time lapse. The MacBook Air finished first at 10 minutes and 48 seconds, while the MacBook Pro came in at 12 minutes and 38 seconds. And here's a little more information with the activity monitor up on both computers. Uh, so here you can see how the memory is being used, how the CPU is being used, and the graphics card. As you can see on the M1 Mac, the graphics card is being utilized much more than on the Intel Mac. Um, Lightroom basically ignores the graphics card on the Intel MacBook. The CPU cores are basically being maxed out the entire time and on the M1 Mac the RAM is being used a little bit more. I was also curious to see how thermal throttling might come into play here. Since the MacBook Pro has a fan and the MacBook Air doesn't even have a fan, that was one of the major concerns that I had with buying the Air. Uh, I was worried that over long-term heavy usage that the processing power would slow down a lot and the results were kind of interesting. Later on I ran this same time-lapse export three times in a row and I didn't let the computers cool down in between so they essentially exported 900 pictures uh, with no cool down time. On round one the MacBook Air exported all 311 minutes and 30 seconds while the MacBook Pro came in at 13 minutes and 18 seconds but then round two they basically evened out. Uh, the MacBook Pro's fan was on full blast the whole time and the MacBook Air was starting to heat up. So with the second 300 picture export, the Air came in at 13 minutes and 11 seconds while the Pro came in a little bit faster at 13 minutes and 5 seconds. And then the, the major difference really showed up in round 3. Uh, the MacBook Air took 13 minutes and 54 seconds to export the same 300 picture sequence while the MacBook Pro only took 12 minutes and 50 seconds which is interesting because that Intel MacBook Pro exported that 300 picture sequence faster on the third round than it did on the first round when it started out cool. Now over on my 2014 iMac I'm doing the same 300 picture export and there's much different technology inside this computer compared to the newer MacBooks. Even the Intel MacBook Pro is a four core processor but it has four virtual cores so that it can virtually uh, double the core count. Um, this older iMac only has four cores. And because of that, it takes much longer to export these 300 pictures. Uh, so the iMac took 24 minutes and 24 seconds. It's interesting that that's basically double what the Intel-based MacBook Pro took, which was around 12 minutes. But it makes sense when the Intel processor has four extra virtual cores. Now we are in Final Cut and I'm going to import all 300 of these pictures and compile them into one time lapse. If you don't know how time lapses work, each one of these JPEGs is going to be one frame in video. And in a sequence where each second has 30 frames, that means 30 pictures equals one second of time lapse. These time lapses are going to be in 6K resolution and I'm going to export them to ProRes 422. So this is where you can really tell the difference between the different chips that are in these computers. 
The M1 Mac finished this export in 1 minute and 47 seconds, while the Intel Mac took 3 minutes and 31 seconds. And I assume that's because Final Cut is optimized for this chip, and because I'm exporting to Apple ProRes. And then I took those same 300 pictures into Final Cut on my iMac, and I exported those to Apple ProRes. What's interesting about this test is that this time the iMac did beat the Intel-based MacBook Pro. The iMac came in at 3 minutes and 5 seconds, while the Intel MacBook came in at 3 minutes and 31 seconds. And of course the MacBook Air beat everything at 1 minute and 47 seconds. And then another test I'll be doing is within Final Cut, um, just a quick edit of a 4K timeline using drone footage from a DJI Pro. Uh, so that's all 4K video. It's a pretty simple 4K timeline, just one layer of video with one layer of color grading added and some text. For both of these laptops that's no big deal uh, to have a timeline like that, but where you start to see the difference is in the export times. For the first export of this project I chose to export it to H.264 and the results of this were kind of interesting. It seems like the Intel based Mac is more optimized for this format and it actually completed the export faster. This was a two minute project and the Intel Mac exported it in one minute and 29 seconds while the M1 Mac took one minute and 46 seconds to export. Exporting the same project from my 2014 iMac gave us kind of a surprising result. It beat everything coming in at one minute and 27 seconds. Just barely beating the M1 MacBook Air at one minute and 29 seconds. Next I sent the project over to Compressor to see if I could get some different results. I used their built-in setting for YouTube and Facebook, which is another version of H.264, and both tests took way longer than inside Final Cut, but with this test, the M1 Mac won. Uh, it came in at 3 minutes and 9 seconds, while the Intel Mac took 4 minutes and 36 seconds. Bringing the same project over to a compressor on the iMac, it was edged out by the M1 Mac this time, coming in at 3 minutes and 34 seconds which is right in the middle between the M1 MacBook and the Intel MacBook. And then just for fun, I will kind of max out a timeline in Final Cut, add a whole bunch of layers, a whole bunch of effects, a whole bunch of text and graphics and everything, and, and try and get it to the point where the computer starts skipping and they can't play back smoothly. And with both of the laptops, I was pretty impressed with how many layers and effects I could add before they started lagging. So for each computer I did a 4K timeline and then I threw in a couple layers of 4K H.264 video and a few of those time lapses which are 6K and they are Apple ProRes. With the uh, Intel MacBook I had two layers of that 4K video and then two layers of the 6K time lapse. Uh, I slowed down the time lapse and I put color grading and effects on all the clips and a couple uh, text layers in there too, and I started getting some dropped frames at that point. With the M1 Mac it took a lot more than that. I had two layers of the 4K video and then four layers of that 6K time lapse. Everything had color grading layers, uh, they all had at least one effect, maybe multiple effects on them, and I overlapped a few text layers. All the clips had lowered opacity so that every single clip in that timeline was being shown in the same shot. And even with all that I was still playing back every single frame. Another important difference between these two computers is battery life. And even though the MacBook Air has a smaller battery, it lasts longer because the chip is more efficient and it doesn't draw as much power. So after running all these tests, the MacBook Air was at 81% and the MacBook Pro was at 52%. Overall, some of these tests were kind of surprising. Um, just based on the reviews that I've been seeing, I expected the MacBook Air to just blow the Intel-based MacBook Pro out of the water. Um, but there is there are a few tasks that the Intel-based MacBook Pro actually did better than the MacBook Air. Um, but with that being said, overall the M1 MacBook Air performed way better than the Intel-based MacBook Pro. <laughs> I never thought I'd see the day when a MacBook Air could outcompete a MacBook Pro. So pretty impressive and I'll be putting this Intel MacBook Pro up on eBay and hopefully I can get most of my money back that I spent on the MacBook Air.